I think that question, which is the importance of the nurturing environment versus nature, uh, which, which was asked by the Greeks and by others in ancient times, is how much do we inherit and how much uh, do we influence by the way we run our lives, is a very old question. That question has been quieted down, silenced, by, the, um, by uh, Darwinian theory and modern genetics and the grand synthesis of DNA biochemistry and Mendelian genetics. And the idea that genotype and phenotype are so intimately related became deterministic in the way of our thinking. It wasn't justified by neither Darwinian theory or Mendelian theory, but it became almost a way of thinking is, I'm bad because I inherited bad genes, I'm smart because I inherited smart genes. And that's probably true to a certain extent. But we know, for example, that that relationship is important. So the big question is, how does it work? Does Mendelian theory or DNA theory explain how that relationship works. And we also know that environments do count. And that relationship can occur in different environments. So these environments are different physically, they're different economically, they're different socially. So how does the individual DNA interact with all of these things? Is it important at all? And I think if Maybe 10 years ago, we would answer, no, it's not that important. We'll sequence humans, we will beat Bonferroni by having a lot of people, and we will find all the SNPs that have to do with how you vote and how you eat and what religion you practice. And, and that shapes, of course, certain philosophy that is extremely, extremely important as far as everything, from policy making to the way you run your own family. But the truth is, that good biologists knew for a long time that genotype is not equal to phenotype. And the, the first challenge to genotype equals phenotype theory comes from embryology, from the fact that we all carry one genotype and express probably a billion different phenotypes. So how can one genome express a billion different phenotypes? And that question appeared in embryology in the beginning of the century or even before, even before we understood genetics very well the way we understand DNA theory today. And a scientist called uh, Conrad Waddington in the United Kingdom developed this term epigenesis or epigenetics. And he suggested that there must be something happening to genes during embryo uh, embryology, during embryological de development that canalizes those genes to different fates. And he called this epigenetics. He had no idea what it means. But that's the beauty of human knowledge. We can understand things without knowing anything about them. It's like Darwin, Darwin developed this fantastic evolutionary theory without understanding what DNA is, without understanding what is in the sperm, without understanding what the gene is. And he was, you know, kind of right. And the same way I think Waddington was kind of right without knowing the biochemistry behind that. But in the last 50 years, uh, we know the biochemistry behind the epigenetics. We know that two major things happen to DNA during embryological development. One thing is that the DNA is packaged in chromatin. You know, DNA is meters long and is packaged into micrometer uh, nucleus. And so this is a architectural challenge. Uh, that nature has solved by packaging the DNA in very sophisticated ways. For many years, we thought this is just packaging material. You know, you unwrap your Christmas gifts. And uh, now we understand that this packaging material is essentially involved in defining which gene is expressed when, where, how much in response to what signal. Because genes work, it's not unidimensional, it's not bidimensional, it's multidimensional. It works in space. It works in time, it works in response to the environment all the time. So this packaging material is extremely important, we call it chromatin, it's chemically modified. And then, even more fascinating, I think, from the philosophical point of view, is that the DNA molecule itself, the genetic mo molecular chemistry itself, 
can be modified by a methyl group. And that methyl group, which is one of the smallest chemical molecules in nature, forms one of the strongest bonds in nature with DNA. So um, the bond between a chemical, uh, between a methyl group and a cytosine ring is one of the strongest bonds in nature to break. So the DNA comes out when you were born with two identities. One is the ancestral identity. It's the way we inherited it and the way it was changed in human and evolution in general. And the second one is this pattern of methyl groups, which is your cellular identity. So you inherit on one hand one common identity that you'll find everywhere in your body that you got from your father and mother and billions of cellular identities that are slightly or very different from each other. So we can take now a DNA from a mummy or a Neanderthal or a Denisovan that died who knows how many tens of thousands of years ago and sequence the DNA and get information about all the fascinating things about where the genes went through homos, homonoid evolution. But we can also find out the methylation pattern using some tricks that have to do with the chemistry that has changed uh, in the DNA, find a methylation pattern. And a very interesting paper recently de described the Neanderthal DNA methylation pattern and the difference between Neanderthal DNA methylation pattern and Homo sapiens. And it appears that most of the difference between Neanderthal and Homo sapiens are actually in the way DNA is methylated rather than the sequence of DNA. Which suggests that perhaps an environmental pressure that happened sometime has modified Neanderthals to become Homo sapiens in a way that is not the traditional genetic mutation way. I don't know, and I don't want to talk about it, but that's a possibility. So now the big question, for 50 years we thought, this is very nice, but it's also extremely deterministic. And when I was a graduate student around in the early 80s, I was told that all humans have the same DNA methylation pattern. And we published papers that showing that all humans have the same DNA methylation patterns. And it's true, because your eyes will have a DNA methylation pattern that is different from the liver and from the kidney, and et cetera, et cetera, and it will be similar. Because in the end of the day, we're very similar. Not only we are similar to each other, we're similar to our cousins, the mouse and the, and the rats. And we will have similar methylation patterns to them as well. And that's the question, are you a splitter? Do you find the differences in things or you find what's common in things? So you can look at the same data set and say they're all the same. And because we wanted to think that we are all the same, because it made life much easier, than thinking about other things, we rejected the idea, we didn't even think about the idea, that that DNA methylation pattern actually can change and has a huge potential for change. So what I would like to do today is take the Conrad Waddington concept that explained embryology to explain this, to suggest that the same way DNA can acquire multiple identities during development, so the same identical sequence of DNA could have differences in gene expression that could be 10 million fold different without any change in sequence. Just think about the power of epigenetics. No mutation can do that. That change gene expression at a dynamic range that can go logarithmic scales without changing a base in the sequence can work in giving an experiential identity to DNA. So I would want to argue today that that DNA has three identities. It has the ancestral identity, the cellular identity, and the experiential identity. So that's a summary of my talk. <clears throat> How can this work? And I think it's, it's one of the most intellectually pleasing things that nature has invented. This is the cytosine. It could be methylated so this little metal group is added to this carbon ring here. And this doesn't happen by accident. There's a complex biochemistry that adds it in a highly, highly regulated and responsive way. And that's essential for what we want to talk today. These things don't happen by accident. They're not random, they're not random mutations. They are organized, directed, and planned. And that happens by a donor and this donor is S-adenosylmethionine, which I think will play a very important role in psychology and psychiatry. 
And actually, the availability of SAM can define how well this reaction will go. And once this has happened, so once evolution learned how to methylate DNA, and that happened very early, bacteria know how to methylate DNA, and they use it to differentiate self from non-self. So they know it's my DNA or your DNA, not on the sequence, but on the methylation level. And they use what we call restriction enzymes to restrict a foreign DNA that invaded them if it's not methylated the right way. So this is an old idea in evolution, that you can take the same sequence and give it two identities by adding this methyl group. And what it does, it can, if it happens in strategic positions in genes, it can essentially shut them down. So you have here almost a binary signal that can turn on or off genes, and this can happen, again, at a range of a 10 million fold change in gene expression. So it's a huge effect that it can have. And the way it works, uh, one of the ways it works, it's by blocking the binding of the machinery that turns on genes to genes. So now think about it. Let's take a hippocampus. You have millions of cells in the hippocampus. You have multiple positions, you have multiple genes. Each gene can have different positions where it's regulated. Each one of them could be either methylated or not. Do you understand the combination that you're creating here? So you can now have a continuous scale of expression that can go from zero to 10 million on the scale of how many sites are methylated, how many genes are methylated, how many times they are methylated during the lifetime of that person, and the space of neurons that are methylated. But remember, when you have a 1% change in methylation, it's a 100% change in methylation in 1% of the genes. This is something that my friends don't understand. It's not a 1% change in expression. It's a 100% change in methylation in one site, in one gene, in one neuron. And that can be extremely critical if that neuron sits in a very critical position. So essentially, on that day, the two things have to be created in evolution. The methylation, with the methylation enzymes that learned how to do that, and the fact that now the RNA transcription machinery does not recognize the methylated DNA. So when these two things happened, the potential of the genome expanded a billion fold. Now the same sequence can do so many different things in response to so many different signals. Your genome has now expanded its capacity. <coughs> Not only DNA can be methylated, but there is a very complex chemistry of the chromatin. So these are the histone tails. Um, these are the histone tails of the chromatin. And they are four proteins. Actually, they come in dimers, so we have eight proteins, and the DNA is surrounding that uh, structure. And that defines how packaged the gene is. And each of these modifications can define access to the gene. Look at how many are possible here, and think about the combinations. There are thousands of combinations we already know of, uh, of uh, chromatin modifications, that will add additional plasticity to the way genes work. And what's important to remember, each of these modifications is catalyzed by enzymes. Each of these enzymes is tightly regulated. And as I will show you, each of its enzymes can know how to talk to what we call signaling pathways. Pathways that can introduce signals from the external world to those enzymes. So you have extremely sophisticated machinery that can introduce enormous plasticity. And the red ones are those that shut down genes, the green ones, as we know, turn on genes. So I would, not, I would not confuse you. This is extremely more complicated than DNA methylation, and DNA methylation is complicated enough. So I would not confuse you with this. But I think philosophically we un need to understand that that's there, and that's extremely important. And so there's a good relationship between all of these modifications, right? So each new modification you add, you add another dimension of complexity. And of course, another possibility for combination, and you expand exponentially uh, your plasticity. So a gene, in general terms, could be in this form, highly active. For example, histones are acetylated. The transcription, it's not methylated, and transcription factor is sitting on it. Or in a this way, which is highly silenced, 
It has methylation, which attracts other proteins that recognize methylation, which attracts other proteins and other proteins, and they modify the chromatin, they modify the DNA, and they keep the gene silent. And all of this is highly regulated. The other revolution that happened in my thinking about DNA methylation is the following. And it, I am also interested in the sociology of development of scientific ideas and the social pressure that is beyond scientific ideas. And what is the psychology behind scientific ideas? So when I joined, I, I started as a dental student and I needed to get my doctorate degree, so at the time I had to do a research project to get my doctorate degree in dentistry. And I stumbled across Aaron Razin, who uh, was nominated last year for the Nobel Prize on DNA methylation. He just came back from Caltech, and he discovered the first methyl group in Phi X174, which infects a bacteria, which is totally unimportant to humans or bacteria. But it led to a whole world of research, which, again, is very important about how ideas develop. But when I joined his lab, and I joined his lab because he was just good-looking and a nice guy. I had no idea what DNA is. I knew genetics very well, but I never connected genetics and DNA, and that's how medical teaching was those days. Genetics was playing with a lot of numbers, which I liked. Uh, but, um, and, and I think I skipped the only course on DNA that I had, and he offered to me to work on DNA methylation. I say, you know, DNA methylation, what difference does it make? Will I get my doctorate? And that's all that counts for a dentist. And, um, <laughs> and I started... Uh, working on this, but I, he told me about DNA methylation, and I asked him, what about DNA demethylation? Because I knew enough biochemistry that every reaction has the reaction going the other way. You have phosphatases, you have kinases, you have acetylases, you have deacetylases, you have met methylases. What about the demethylases? He says it doesn't exist. And I asked him, why doesn't it exist? He said, because this bond is so strong you can't break it. And I said, how do you know you can't? And that's the nice thing about being a dental student without scientific education. Because if I was a scientist, I wouldn't ask these questions, right? That's why I think doctors and dentists have, changed, have done a lot of major discoveries because they were so ignorant. And, um, <coughs> and so he, he told me because Cantoni said so. So I asked him, who is Cantoni? You don't know who is Cantoni. He invented acetonazole methionine. So he was one of the greatest chemists in, in metal biology and chemistry, and he said that this reaction cannot go the other way. That has stifled research in DNA methylation for 50 years. Because if DNA could only get methylated and not demethylated, it's not that interesting, right? It's a one-way road. After a while, you methylate whatever could be methylated, and that's it. It's done. And that's why nothing happens after you were born to your DNA methylation. So everything is now fitting, right? So you develop this dogma, which is an absolute truth, you don't ask, and you develop another dogma, you put all the dogmas together, you have a nice worldview of how things work, and you reject any new idea. So for uh, being a rebel, I got attracted to demethylation, and I think now there's no question that there are many biochemical activities that can remove methyl groups. And that's very important, because this means that you can go back. And if you can go back, it means you can do to DNA what you cannot do with a genetic mutation. It's very hard to physiologically fix a genetic mutation. It's possible. We do it all the time by mismatch repair. But generally, we don't do that. But if you have now a piece of chemistry that is reversible on that DNA molecule, just think about the potential that it provides you. So the first test is this. Does this really happen? So there's one thing, you know, philosophically saying that it's possible for DNA to change its methylation, but does it actually change its DNA methylation? So the, of course, there's one way for DNA to lose methylation, and that's when DNA divides. Because there are two machineries. One machinery copies the DNA, and the other machinery adds methyl groups. So if you block the ma machinery that adds methyl group, you lose methyl groups. And that happens in cancer. But the brain doesn't work like this. Most of our neurons don't divide. When I talk to you now, there might be some cell division going on, we, probably more than we thought, but probably most of the changes that are going to happen in your brain are not going to be dependent on cell division. And I got interested in the brain because if you think plasticity, probably this is the organ that we have that has the highest demand for plasticity. 
So we took hippocampal neurons and we put them in a tissue culture dish. You have here each of the chromosomes. We never published this experiment and probably we will never publish it because I already talked about it so many times. Um, uh, but I think uh, there are other experiments uh, by other labs that showed very similar things. But it's just my experiment, so I show you mine. And uh, so here you have all the chromosomes. Here you have peaks of genes that got more methylated in red and blue that got less methylated. So this is a genome-wide analysis. This was w uh, based on an older technology that we used to analyze methylation. The bottom line is, we added kinic acid to these neurons. The reason why we added kinic acid is because it acts on a very common receptor. And what I wanted to do is there is a conduit by which an environment can change methylation in the brain. And if you think about how the environment can work on your brain, it's through eliciting neurotransmitter release. So now as we're talking, you're releasing glutamate, you're releasing kinic, you're losing, activating kinic receptors and, and other glutamate receptors. So can this change DNA methylation? So can a signal that happens on the surface of a neuron cause a change in DNA methylation? And as you can see, you have massive changes in DNA methylation all across the genome. They're highly organized, and that's important. The genes that get changed sit next to each other. Uh, they are structurally evolution. Put them also in the genome next to each other so they can receive those signals uh, in, in, in also in a space dimension. And I think this is not, again, this has evolved, and it could go both ways. So, if this is true, if such a conduit exists, let's think about the gene in a very different way. A gene is not something you sequence, and that's it, and that tells you everything. A gene is not something that gets methylated during embryology. And that's everything. So a gene emerges at birth like this, either here or here. But this is some sort of a steady state that it keeps listening to the world. And the world can talk to the gene through different ways. Could be food, could be toxins that we, all governments are afraid of, but could be also social signals. For the first time, it dawned on to me, why do we actually separate chemical toxins from social signals? How, does social, how do social signals work? They elicit chemistry in the brain. Perhaps the best chemistry ever is the one that we can produce in our brain. It took billions of years of evolution to create that chemistry, right? No chemical fac fac uh, facility will ever produce the chemistry that your brain is producing as you're listening to my talk. So all of these are integrated into signaling pathways, like the one I showed you before with a kinic acid. And these methyl groups are going on and off in response to these signals. So when I take a DNA from a biopsy, I take a snapshot. But it's a movie. DNA is a movie. The script is written, but it's interactive. Somebody is playing with, with the remote control to remove an actor, to add an actor, to speed, to slow down. And you're like capturing one screen of this entire movie. And if we start understanding the DNA is working in those space and time dimensions as an ever-expanding script, then you start thinking about genes in a very different way. So this mechanism can actually work at multiple time scales. Another thing scientists like to do is define things and by this actually freeze them, right? So, you know, in the Middle Ages, the big question that people killed each other about was the definition of God. Is God one or three? How are the three parts connected to each other? How many angels are there? How do they sit on one needle? And uh, in, our th in my epigenetics world, the, qu the big question that people kill each other is the definition of epigenetics. What is the definition of epigenetics? Is epigenetics a change to a function of a gene that is heritable or doesn't have to be heritable? And, uh, you know, my philosophy is we shouldn't argue. We should just see what the biochemistry is and uh, see what the potential is. So if you have this, if you're God and created that biochemistry, now, what, what games can you play with it? 
And you can see that you can play many different games with this tool that you have now created. It could work on an evolutionary scale, and perhaps what happened to Neanderthal when their homo boxes got methylated is an example, but perhaps there are many other examples that what's driving evolution is not just genetic changes, but also epigenetic changes. I know nothing about evolution, so I would not talk about this, but there are people who are discussing this seriously. There's a transgenerational time scale, which is becoming a very hot field. I, I, I don't do much about that, but um, I, we're aware of what's going on there, and it's a fascinating question. So the question is, our DNA carries on just our experiences or ancestral experiences? The reason why we never discuss this as a possibility, because somebody said that all the DNA methylation is erased at fertilization. And that was based on looking at two genes. But this is how we develop concepts in science. We show one gene, we publish a nature paper, everybody remembers that paper. All methylation is erased in fertilization. Now we publish other nature papers and show not all methylation is erased in fertilization, some is not. And that some might make, make a huge difference. And we know that the chromatin we thought is gone in sperm, now we know there is chrom some chromatin in sperm. Uh, so this is possible that you will pass uh, transgenerational information. What I will talk to you about the lifelong time scale, like what I started with, is that relationship with the mother in the social environment that can have a large effect uh, later in life. There could be life cycle station time scale. You know, we change. We get weaned, extremely stressful thing, losing our mother's immediate connection. Then we get puberty where hormones are flowing all over the place. And they can do it in very different contexts. And we know it has an impact on how we sexually develop. Then we get the middle age and we age. And all these things, uh, epigenetic processes, can play a very important role in. And there's the seasonal time scale. Season is extremely important. It's exported in evolution. It defines how we live. For people who live here, the summers have long days and short nights. The winters have long nights and short days. Circadian rhythm is completely different than a person living in Ecuador, where all year round you have the same circadian rhythm. How did our body fix that? How did we change our metabolism to adapt to this? I'm sure Epigen and we have some papers on, on this question as well. And the beauty of that mechanism is it can work in a million years time scale, and also in two minute time scale. Because if enzymes can remove or add methyl groups, they can do it very fast. And we know that in the brain, when animals learn, there are very fast methylation changes happening. And some of them are transient, and some of them are not. So you understand how such a mechanism can add flexibility to the genome at multiple dimensions. And this is something I think that rather than arguing about what is the definition of epigenetics. Let's look at what is the potential of such a biochemical mechanism. So my theory uh, that is our working hypothesis regarding the lifelong signal is a child comes to this world with a genome that we inherited that has evolved in human evolution, and we had nice discussions of this yesterday, that kind of fit, so if you were born in Tibet, you will have the right gene to fit with the oxygen. But you know what? Your father in Tibet got a job in Shanghai. So now he's moving to Shanghai. So what is your genome going to do with it? Wait for natural selection to uh, fix this back again to a new gene? Or did evolution come with a better trick uh, to adapt your genome? So that's a physical signal, right? You've changed now oxygen levels. But also you change the kind of bacteria that evolution has learned you to deal with. As a child is born, it leaves the cervix of his mother encountering hundreds of new species of bacteria that it will remember for the entire life and will define not only its physiology but also its mental health. So that's the bioenvironment. And of course, there's the social environment. It's not necessarily exactly as natural selection has prepared us for. So I think what natural selection also created is the methyl group and the chromatin and the plasticity. So as the child is born in its first years, these environments keep feeding into signaling pathways, like 
the kinetic acid that I showed you, that it's going to tweak the genome so that it adjusts to those environment signals. And that will create a phenotype that is adaptive to these environments. But as your father got his job in Shanghai, now he got promoted and he moves to New York. And what happens in New York? There's a McDonald's that sells you a lot of calories for no money. So the genome that was prepared by natural selection for, uh, for Tibet and was adapted by epigenetics in Shanghai has now to deal with New York. And that creates challenges that sometimes you can't fit with. And that can create health challenges. So I believe that that gives us a general theory of both well-being and disease as a continuum of the same process of the genome's attempts to adapt that are probably correct and very good in most of the cases, but fail in some cases because our brains are faster in changing the environment than even the epigenetic process is fast in adapting to those new environments. So you can think about all human disease, from high blood pressure to cancer to obesity uh, to um, schizophrenia and autism as adaptations in the wrong context, rather to think, think, to think about them as, as some sort of a pathology. And pathology is somewhere on this continuum where producing new cells is cutting it, it's creating a disease rather than dealing with injury. And, uh, and where, you know, um, your traits that could have made you a genius in one environment cre creates, makes you a social misfit in a certain environment and so on and so forth. So, you know, being a, a hardcore scientist, you know, I didn't tell you that before I did dentistry, I studied philosophy. So, um, and I always longed for philosophy, the freedom of thinking without being limiting by data. But, uh, but uh, you know, it was an amazing. I did, never had to write a grant. Uh, you know, you just walk in the jungle and you can come, come up with new ideas. But in science, unfortunately, you have to, to develop experiments to prove those ideas. And actually, the Eureka for me came from another serendipitous meeting that I had with Michael Meany, who I'm sure many of you knew, who is a psychobiologist. And he was interested, since his early career, in maternal care. And since his postdoc, he, was de he developed this simple natural model of maternal care, which is just look at animals, and you will see that they do maternal care differently. And even this rat, uh, which is, has been bred in cages and, and you know, animal facilities for generations. It's probably not a normal creature anymore. But still, there's a natural distribution of maternal care. And he noticed that some of the rats do more uh, than others. And when he removed the pups from the rat, I mean, when he followed these pups, he didn't remove them. The beauty of that model is that he, all he did is take videos and I always envied his students while we were, you know, running sequencing gels and getting radioactive contamination. He was watching videos of animals licking and grooming. And, you know, in the beginning I thought this is not real science. Uh, but, uh, but after a while, um, after we had a lot of beers together, uh, he convinced me that there must be something interesting in it. And what was interesting is that when you follow these rats that had what we call high licking and grooming mothers and low licking and grooming mothers, you saw that they developed different phenotypes. And at the time, he was interested and is still interested in stress phenotypes. And they had different stress responsivity. So you can tell which animal had a high or low licking and grooming mother. So that sounds like science fiction, like grandmother tales. Uh, you know, maternal love creates, you know, less stressful uh, offspring. Uh, but is there a biochemistry behind that? And so one of the things this group did is to show that there is differences in expression of glucocorticoid receptor gene between these animals that is behind the stress response. But all of this could be genetic. They might be some alleles of bad mothers. They're not bad mothers, by the way. We'll talk about that. But let's call them low-licking grooming mothers that also makes their, the same allele can make their offspring stressful. And he did spend a lot of time looking for SNPs. But the 
critical experiment was this, which you can do in rats, which is very hard to do in humans or even monkeys, it's cross-fostering. You can actually separate the offsprings of a low-licking grooming mother and cross-foster to a high and do the, all the combinations. And what you learn is that has nothing to do with genes. Nothing at all with genes. Of course, there's a glucocorticoid receptor gene, but it's not the difference in the gene that defines the difference in the phenotype. It's the fostering mother. It's the behavior of the mother that defines this extremely strong phenotype with no contribution of the gene differences whatsoever. And so we went to understand how this can work. And, uh, and this is kind of a general concept of what we have. And as I keep telling my medical students, uh, what I tell you today might be wrong tomorrow, so don't kill me. Uh, science is, is generating hypotheses that could be refuted. But this is what we think about is going on today. And I think it, it provides a paradigm that we can think about other issues. This behavior elicits a signaling pathway in the brain. So that ties to the first slide I showed you, which then kicks on the heads of other proteins, essentially proteins that can read the signals. Uh, protein kinase A can now activate a transcription factor. This is really important. You see, signals from the environment will never go to particular addresses in DNA without somebody taking them in a very careful way. Transcription factors are really the postman of the cell, right? They can read zip codes on DNA and take a letter to John in Montreal and deliver it to the right street, to the right home, to the right address. So when a mother sends this loving, licking signals, it kicks the head of transcription factors. They now go to the right genes and tweak their epigenetic state. It's not a change like we see in cancer from zero to one. It is going on and off all the time because the more they lick, the more delivery of chromatin enzyme to the gene, the more the gene looks like this, the less the lick it looks like this. If they have this gene, they're less stressful. If they have this kind, they're more stressful. And these differences in expression are large, much larger than you will see with any SNP you'll find. But the interesting thing about it is it's highly stable. So it will remain for their life. But also, the mothers who were born, and this is not the glucocorticoid receptor gene in the case of motherhood, it's the estrogen receptor gene, with a certain methylation pattern. So the mothers who were born to mothers who were low licking and grooming will become low licking and grooming not by genetics, by the behavior of the mother. So if the mother has a behavior that is low licking and grooming, the offspring will have a behavior that is low licking and grooming, the granddaughter will have a behavior of low. You can pass it multiple generations without any need for genetic difference because the behavioral patterns are inherited as well. And behavioral patterns are probably the one of the strongest vectors in inheritance. So you're not just the genes you inherited from your parents, you're also the behavior that you inherited from the parents. Many times it's connected, but if it's cross-fostered, it doesn't have to be connected. Excuse me. Another important thing about it, I'm a pharmacologist, right? So my business is in creating drugs, getting patents and funding my lab. No, but because we believe that, uh, that uh, you know, in difference from geneticists to want to document human misery, uh, we believe that we can fix human misery by, by giving drugs that can change things. So the big question here is the beauty of the epigenetic system. Because it's a bidirectional enzymatic reaction, this is what we like to work on. We like to develop inhibitors and agonists of reactions that go both ways. Can we change the behavior of the animals with drugs? So we took the adult rats that had this phenotype, ejecting them with methionine, which actually is a natural product, and converted them to this phenotype. And we could inject these animals with trichostatin A, which is an inhibitor of chromatin structure and also of methylation, and convert them to this phenotype. So, and I believe that epigenetic therapeutics will play an immense role in psychiatry in cases where we need therapeutics. I believe that behavior will probably be the better therapeutics in most cases. But I think that there is a huge potential for this. I'll show you one example if we have the time in the end. The next challenge was to translate it to human, and that's where everything falls apart, right? 
Because the main challenge in humans, and I'm sure you all know about it, that's why devel you develop many, many strategic statistical tools to determine cause and effect. And a big problem in gene-environment interactions is did the gene cause the environment or are they independent um, events interacting with each other? And it's very hard to sort out. So I cannot provide proof in humans the way we can provide in animals. In animals, we can be convinced that it's not genetics by cross-fostering. We can randomize the treatment. We can do things. You cannot randomize child abuse. You can never say whether child abuse was genetically caused by the bad genes of the parents or is it an environment that caused the behavior, right? But what you can do is use evolutionary arguments. We say, if our cousin the rat shows that a glucocorticoid receptor is methylated when she was poorly licked, and in a human that was abused as a child, the same position is doing the same thing, I'm confident that there is something going on there. So this is what we will do. And so we looked at um, abuse, the, and this was a collaboration with another great guy at McGill, uh, Gustavo Torecki, who is a psychiatrist geneticist, and uh, he had a collection of brains that were very well psychoautopsied, so we can ask questions about a lot of different things, uh, including uh, child abuse. And uh, the bottom line is that we found changes in methylation at very, very similar positions in the people who were abused as children, notwithstanding whether they committed suicide or not, um, eh, suggesting that there is a strong evolutionary conservation of this kind of response uh, to child abuse. So, the next question is, is the response limited to the brain? And that's important from philosophical points of view, from medical points of view, and from practical points of view. Because most sociologists do not get longitudinal sampling of brains of their subjects during a study. Yeah, very few studies will donate their hippocampus multiple times. Could be done, but I'm not recommending that. And so, uh, so how, how would you know the truth in humans? Once they're dead, like what we did here, it's okay, but you don't know, right? Because it's the end of the story. If it is a movie, you want to watch the movie as it, as it unfolds. So the question was, and this is still a sticking point, and I haven't sat in one review committee that did not reject all the grants that wanted to look in, psych you know, in psychiatry phenotypes in blood. It's almost like the automatic... Like, why do you write the grant even? Just say, reject me, you know, if you want to go to blood. Because then there's all the psychiatry types. They will tell you how complex the brain is and how complex the circuitry is and how complex the anatomy of the brain is. How on earth are you going to study a psychiatry phenotype uh, in blood? And they're right. Perhaps. But if you think, the way I started my lecture, that environments are really connected, that when a child faces an adverse environment, it's not just social environment that is faced. It comes as a package deal with the biological, which evokes the immune system, and the physical, which evokes metabolism, uh, the cardiovascular physiology, etc. Perhaps there are integrated signals, and perhaps the maternal treatment is not just sending a psych psychiatry kind of signal, a psychological signal, it's sending an integrated signal. It's not just the mother's psychology. It's also the size of the house. It's the weather outside. It's the amount of food. It's how the mother f um, is doing things. So it's a combination of things. And if this is true, social signals should not be limited to the brain. And they should occur in the entire body. The other question, which is another grant killer, it's called a fishing expedition. Uh, you know, you know, I have now 25 grants that I need to review, and I keep getting an email every five minutes is why I didn't submit my reviews yet. At the same time, I keep getting emails from my colleagues, why didn't I comment on their paper, and my students who have questions, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So the only way to deal with this is just to ignore it or to become insane. Uh, but what will happen is that I will look at each of these grants for two or three minutes, and I will try to find an easy way to reject them. And, the, uh, and the, way, the way to reject a grant is to suggest that this person has no hypothesis. He's a fisherman. 
he's going to fish for a hypothesis. And that was a killer of most molecular biology grants for maybe 50 years. You had to have a gene. That's why we were so successful with glucocorticoid receptor. That's a cool gene, right? You have the HPA. We all learned about it in high school. It, it fits very well. But is it all story? Is it just a glucocorticoid receptor? Do genes work like this? Genes are a highly sophisticated corporation. It's like General Electric's or IBM. It's not one gene that works. It's like taking one secretary from IBM and think the whole system will fall apart. But that secretary is connected to a boss who, sit, who sits in that meeting, who has other colleagues from other committee, who have a joint committee. This is how the genome works. So the idea that you will go for one gene and explain things is, is extremely naive. So how do we address this? With another experimental paradigm. And here we, uh, we looked at uh, a collaboration with Steve Sumi, who was examining for years monkeys that were either treated, um, either exposed to a real mother or reared with a surrogate mother. And what we found was that uh, during when they become adults, we wanted to look at two tissues, the brain, the prefrontal cortex, and the immune system, T cells. And we asked two questions. Is there any change registered in DNA methylation pattern in these monkeys only in the brain? Is it in the glucocorticoid receptor only or five other usual suspects, dopamine receptor, serotonin transporter, or things like that? Or is it genome-wide? And how similar are the changes in the two tissues? And the answer is as follows. First, so here the zero indicates no uh, differences. These are all the chromosomes. Um, these are the confidence intervals, so anything that goes up is a distinct change. Since it's a 30,000 feet map of the genome, you know, genome maps are like Google Maps. You can go zoom and zoom in. You can go from this map into a single nucleotide, but I offer you the 30,000 feet vision. You can see organized changes, localized changes. They happen in both tissues sometimes in the same places and sometimes in other places, which makes absolute sense. The immune system responds to a lack of a mother in a different way than the prefrontal cortex responds. And I will guess that every neuron in the prefrontal cortex will respond to that deprivation of a mother in a different way, because they need to adjust to that new situation. I'm starting to run out of time because I had too much fun, and I will skip here to a an interesting study that we did. So these were adults. The next question we asked, so when we published this paper, it says, oh, big deal, adults, you know, so many things happened to them since you separated them from their mother. How do you know whether these methylation differences have anything to do with their mothers? So we started a longitudinal study with, with, uh, with Steve, and we did two things. We first discovered that they are females in the world because we ignored females all the time. And no biologists like to work on females because, you know, puberty introduces some hormonal issues, uh, periodicity, and you want simple males to be, uh, to be studied. And, uh, and the other thing, any, anyways, we assume males and females are the same, so why, why bother? And so for the first time, we performed a longitudinal study with males and females separated from their mother or with their mother. And we looked at differences in DNA methylation. So this is essentially the differences. Look, almost half the genome changes methylation at 14 days when you remove the mother. This is in T cells, right? These are living monkeys, because now we've found that it's legit to look at T cells. You see that there are differences between males and males. Actually, the largest differences I ever observed in DNA methylation between anything I studied is between males and females. So far as epigenetic is considered, males and females are completely different uh, organisms. They are totally different. But also the response to the mother is different. And what you see is that uh, these differences become very small before and after weaning. You know why? because weaning is exactly what Steve Sumi does to them in seven days. When you lose your mother, normally at two years or a year and a half, or you lose her artificially because the experimentalist removed your mother, the body recognizes it in the same way. 
and I'll show you that the genes that respond to losing your mother, either normally or artificially, are very similar. But what happens later is, whereas the females kind of reduce the number of genes that are different, the males increase them. So the memory of this separation, even though it kind of removed here, comes back uh, later in life. And even though they're the same genes that are affected, but removing a mother in two weeks is not like removing her normally in one and a half year. So the overlap is big. It's huge between the genes that are affected by the normal removal of a mother and weaning and the artificial removal of a mother, but there's still differences remain. And that memory probably is very important for the absolutely different phenotype of these animals. And these animals are different on everything, from cardiovascular health to anxiety to sexual aggression to almost every phenotype you measure. These animals that had a mother or not are totally different. So I would like to, to show you another study that we did, which is asking, do you really need the social interaction to generate that? So of course, when a monkey is seven days old, already has social interactions. It sees the nurse that takes care of him rather than the mother. But what happened to the placenta when you're born? Does the placenta register your maternal social behavior? So in primates, like in humans, social rank is extremely important, and I think we discussed that yesterday a bit. So we took placentas from high-ranking mother and low-ranking mother, and looked at the differences in DNA methylation between high rank and low rank. And you can see here, just this heat map to, um, to orient you with it. So each row here is a gene. The color indicates if it's more methylated. So red, we, we use red for more methylated because it's a stop signal, and green for less methylated. And you can see the perfect clustering of these animals by rank and the dramatic differences in DNA methylation already at birth. The placenta knows my mother is a full professor or just an assistant professor, right? She knows the rank of the mother at birth, even before it formed any new social interactions. And we then applied a penalized uh, algorithm to see if well, methylation patterns at birth could actually serve as predictor of your social status. So we found that only two genes, the way penalized works, it's actually we have thousands of genes, but it finds the minimal markers that you need to use as a predictor. It found only two CGs were sufficient to predict the social status, and the correlation is 0.975. So, uh, so you can see how powerful uh, these effects are uh, at birth. So I will just give you another last study that we did, and I'll stop here, is I was not happy with the fact that we cannot randomize adversity in humans. As a scientist, you want to do that. And by the way, I would get credit, you know, when my scientists were used to work with yeast strains, uh, do epigenetics of yeast, and you know, in yeast you can do whatever you want, um, we're criticizing human studies because uh, humans are heterogeneous. Oh, what do you want me to do, to breed them? And, uh, <laughs> or that they, you know, you didn't randomize child abuse or things like that. But sometimes nature does it for you. And one of the ways to randomize adversity is have a natural disaster. So another great colleague of mine at the Douglas Institute at McGill, Suzanne King, she was interested in natural disasters and then following children whose mother was born, whose mother was exposed to natural disaster during her pregnancy, following them through life. And one of the greatest disasters in Quebec was the ice storm of 1998. And so this was 17 years ago. This is how Montreal looked like then. Uh, it was a ghost town. We had no electricity. The temperature was between minus 20 and minus 30. And there was meters of ice everywhere. It was an unusual natural phenomena where the uh, earth was colder than the skies. So uh, all the rain that came down turned into, sky, into, uh, into ice. And essentially, for six weeks, parts of the Quebec population had no electricity. And you can imagine, if you're a pregnant mother and the temperature is minus 20, this is stressful. And so she, she took advantage of it, and she started following these mothers. She developed an objective stress um, 
uh, score, which looked at threat, loss, scope, and change, each with equal scales, and somehow gave a scale to all these mothers. And then when they're 15, we looked at the methylation patterns in T cells of their children. And what we did is a Pearson correlation between the methylation state of 450,000 sites in the genome and the objective stress. And we found very, very strong correlation of these sites. And as you can see, these are more methylated sites that get demethylated when stress goes up. And, the, and, the, <laughs> and these are sites that get more methylated when stress goes up. And what's interesting is that if you take each of these sites, uh, you can show a very nice linear correlation between the extent of methylation of the site and the extent of stress. So similar to what we showed you about the social structure, and this is a, a randomized natural disaster. So we can go with this. Uh, we are now performing mediation analysis. The genes that were involved really exemplified my first slide. So we had a group of genes involved in immunity. We had a group of genes involved in obesity. We had a group of genes involved in behavior. And mediation analysis suggests which of these genes are mediating the effect of the ice storm on the phenotypes uh, of, of the children. I'll stop here just to give you time to ask questions. There's a lot to, um, uh, to discuss. Uh, but generally what I would like to suggest is that we have evolved the mechanism by which we can get an experiential identity to our DNA. So experience uh, can affect signaling pathways that usually happens in the brain. Of course, if it's a metabolic signal, it will happen in other tissues. Uh, but if it's a social signal, it will mostly register in the brain. The brain releases hormones and microRNAs that are not systemically distributed. They now act on signaling pathways that will either move or remove enzymes that methylate or demethylate DNA. And they will change the developmental trajectory of methylation. So, DNA methylation changes, of course, with development and with age, and these things are going to change that developmental trajectory and create a phenotype, phenotype A or phenotype B on the same genome in response to those uh, signals. The, the proof that we have that actually hormones and glucocorticoid receptors are involved in that is genetic. So we looked at a mouse that has only one copy of the glucocorticoid receptor. So it expresses 50% of the glucocorticoid receptor. And we asked, if our theory is right, that glucocorticoid receptor is mediating those effects. So if you lose 50% of your glucocorticoid receptor, you should have a DNA methylation difference. So we mapped the DNA methylation difference across the genome. And I'm showing you here, this is the difference between males and females who are wild type for glucocorticoid receptor. This is the difference in females who lost one copy of the gene. See, huge differences in methylation where the blues are less, the red are more. This is the differences in male. Look at this gene sex interaction. In the wild type, they're almost the same here. In the, homos in the heterozygous, these guys are mostly demethylated, the female. The males are mostly methylated. And when you now compare the males and females, you find a huge difference between the males and females. So when they had one copy of the glucocorticoid receptor, they were very similar. When they have now, when they had two copies, when they have one copy, they're very different. So this is a classic genetic, epigenetic kind of interaction. How genes that are critical for generating the epigenetic profile can affect dramatically the epigenetic profile. So I'm not telling you the genes are not important. Of course, the epigenetic machinery is encoded by genes. And these genes also evolved and also work, work through natural selection. So the extent of plasticity that we have with this system is defined by how the genes that are regulating the system are, are, are coded. And they, of course, interact as well uh, with gender. And gender is really extremely important, but it becomes more important in certain genetic contexts and not the others. So uh, the last thing I want to tell you is that we are using this now, this idea, to, um, to generate 
drugs for psychiatry conditions. Because we are saying, if we have phenotype A and we don't like it, and we want to move to phenotype B, uh, in certain pathological conditions, phenotype A could be disastrous. For example, if you're a cocaine addict, um, and at that stage, uh, can we use pharmacological tools uh, to tweak the epigenetic system to change it? And, also, and of course, the other possibility is a behavioral intervention that will do the same. And the third possibility is combining a behavioral intervention with a pharmacological intervention. And I'll show you right, a, a, an example of how we did that. So these are, this is a model uh, in collaboration with Gal Yadid at Bar Ilan University in Israel. He's working on cocaine rats, cocaine addicted rats. And the way he, add, he makes these rats addicted is by first teaching them that cocaine is good for 10 days, then removing the cocaine, what he calls an incubation period, and then showing them a behavioral, a cognitive behavioral therapy, which is showing them the cue of the cocaine, and they go crazy. So when you show them the cue, they go crazy. And this is very similar to what happens to a certain extent in normal population. You know, your kids goes to a party, somebody gives him cocaine, he likes it, forgets about it. A month, two months later, a pusher pushes him the cocaine and becomes addicted. Is something happening during this incubation period where you don't see any cocaine except the memory of the cocaine? So we thought in the beginning that the exposure to cocaine creates an epigenetic change. That is memorized, and then when you see the next bout of cocaine, you evoke that and you become addicted. But what we learned is that during this period, when these animals are totally normal, there's no cocaine, no parties going on, there is a dramatic change in the methylation pattern. And then we said, and so this is just a uh, map of the, the, this is a lot of candidate genes that change their methylation pattern during this time. And then we said, can we now reverse it? Can I use the same trick that we used with Michael Meany, uh, giving them SAM, the donor of methyl group, or a methyl inhibitor, to change their addiction behavior? And the interesting thing about epigenetics is that because we're dealing with programming, perhaps one treatment will be enough. Because once you remove the memory of the cocaine, it's not going to come back unless somebody pushes cocaine again. So we could cure these animals by just one treatment. So that was the idea. Then the question was, when should we treat them? So we treat them at different times, and we found out that it only works if you do it with what we call the cognitive therapy. If you show them the cue, and you give them the drug at the same time, they can either go one way with the methionine, they become super addicted, or you remove their addiction with a DNA methylation inhibitor. And then we visited these rats 30 and 60 days later, they were not addicted. And you know, 60 days in a rat is like many years in a human. So I think that epigenetic therapy offers at least the potential for kind of reprogramming the genome to remove those memories in a way that they will not come back because there's nothing unless there is something to introduce them back. So I will stop here. The way, main mes message is that I think environments are interactive. There are no humans walking with brains without bodies or bodies without brains. And the immune system integrates the two. They're acting on signaling pathways in an integrated way. The genome acts as an integrated organization integrated with the environment, integrated with time, and integrated with history. And these uh, generate phenotypes, and these phenotypes keep talking to the chemical world. And one important thing is, this is the idea of the movie, you know? When you move an actor from a script, the next encounter will be very different than when the actor was there. The same way, if you remove a methyl group early in life, now you see another e experience, that encounter will be different if you didn't remove than if you didn't if you hadn't removed it. So what you're getting is constant change of that interactive movie. And every new epigenetic encounter is based on the history of the previous encounter. And two people can't come to the same encounter with the same genome and react completely differently because the history is different. The matrix on which the epigenetics is working is different. And of course, I tell my uh, medical colleagues that when you give a drug, 
you always wor worry about the genetics, the P450 enzymes, mutations in acetylating enzymes. Did you ever ask what kind of mother that person had? Because that can have probably a wider impact on the way your drugs work than the, uh, the P450 mutation. And the same way, uh, you know, I talk to my uh, social scientist friends who, who think about gender uh, equality and other things without any consideration to the biology of gender, for example. And so we need to talk to each other, understand that this is one world acting on common mechanisms. We can't do one without the other. And uh, that's it. And so there's numerous people I collaborated with. I love to collaborate and talk to people. I hate to send emails to people. I found I get totally paralyzed by Skype or by conference calls. And I was sitting on many NIH panel meeting with conference calls where I had to vote on grants that I never knew even the name of the person who wrote them. Because as soon as the conference call starts, I'm a completely different world. But when you talk to people and you drink beer or wine with people, uh, you generate new ideas and new possibilities. And all of them have to do with some good beer and many great people that I collaborate with. And especially the, uh, the methyl group, uh, which kept me busy since I was 19 years old. And uh, I had my first encounter with the methyl group. And of course, the granting agencies who never supported any of this research, but I thought they did, because I, as I told people here, I ran, I, the challenge of a scientist is to learn how to lie to granting agencies and to tell them what they want to hear and to do what you want to do. And that, uh, that game will keep playing, even though we all know the rules of the game, but it's part of being in a social environment. So thank you very much. So I will have time now, I hope, for some questions for 20, for 15 minutes, and, although I thought I will have much more. <laughs>